Um, weirdly enough, I swear to God, this is the most complex character I've played in my career. I don't know what that says about my career, but it's the truth. It's this, and then when I played a heroin addict, that's the second most complicated. Sponsored by Surfshark VPN. See us at MomoCon 2023. From Transformers to Battleship, the cynical Hollywood trend of the late 2000s was making a movie based on a toy line. So many were either churned out or announced, yet never made, like Hot Wheels or Stretch Armstrong, starring Taylor Lautner. The star of Twilight and Abduction, his finest film, watch my old review on that. If you're curious, there is an animatic clip released on said Armstrong film. <laughs> Wow, with how groundbreaking this looks, it's an utter mystery as to why they would cancel a gritty PG-13 film based on a kid's toy. I guess we'll never know. So anyway, with all those toy movies, a Lego film was announced in 2009, and no one was excited. No one asked for this. Like, come on. At least Transformers had recognizable characters. Who does Lego got? That Indiana Jones ripoff guy from their adventure set, even though they made Indiana Jones toys later. There's no way this movie would be good. Or would it? The LEGO company has been resistant to the idea of a theatrical film for years to protect their brand. But what better time than now with Transformers raking in the money? Warner Brothers would be in charge of the LEGO movie, so they flew writers and producers to Denmark, home of the toys headquarters where they worked together. The LEGO company only wanted to foresee the pre-production planning, but the studio encouraged them to oversee the entire film, and they got Phil Lord and Chris Miller involved. The duo behind 21 Jump Street, clone high and cloudy with a chance of meatballs, if they could turn a 32 page Page storybook into a great film, they could do the same for Lego. And that's what I'm ranking, the four theatrical films and their unfair demise. Maybe some other time I'll cover the Bionicle films, but for now, it's Juice and Jam time. So before the Lego movie, in 2010, there was a leaked pitch. A story about Legos leaving their toy town and exploring a live-action human world. Through their journey, they encountered more Lego societies hidden amongst humans. Kind of makes me think of the ending to Small Soldiers. This was from Blur Studios, the effects house who've animated for Call of Duty, Love Death Robots, and even films for Deadpool and Sonic. Which I would joke about Blur giving us the Lego equivalent of Ugly Sonic, but it already exists. Look up Lego Revenge of the Brick. Everybody looks like an accidental selfie. This here isn't the 500 times Star Wars supposedly died, but I sure wish it did. So back to the canceled Blur film. It sounded interesting, but maybe the Lego company had no interest, or they just didn't trust Blur who had little experience on movies at the time. So let's talk about the real deal. Obey all traffic signs and regulations. Step 13. Tap the charts again. It's everything is awesome. Oh my gosh, I love this song. Everything is awesome. 2014's The Lego Movie was at surface level the typical Chosen One story. These minifig humans live in a society going through the motions. Wake up, work, sleep, repeat. They listen to trendy pop songs like how dare those sheeple listen to what they like. Those sheeple should listen to what I like and only what I like. We need a special minifig that's more special than everyone else. That's Emmett, a construction worker recruited by a secret resistance group to stop an evil businessman from taking over the world. President Business is gonna end the world? But he's such a good guy. And Octan, they make good stuff. Music, dairy products, coffee, TV shows, surveillance systems, all history books, voting machines. Wait a minute. It's very much like The Matrix, Wanted, Ant-Man, probably some other films too. You know, average guy is the chosen one, female sidekick who's far more experienced in this field yet doesn't save the day, all because she's not the chosen one. Talk about a Gary Stew. But the Lego movie totally flips this tired convention for the better. Rather than the you're special and no one else is message, the Lego movie tells us everyone's special, but it's not the cynical moral of. And when everyone's super, <laughs> no one will be. 
It's more so everybody's special in their own unique way. Don't compare yourself to others. Be proud of what you love to make. I'm sure before release, some people expected this to just be a film that happened to have Lego visuals. Like, had everyone been human, nothing would change. Holy crap, I am freaking out. But this could only be a Lego movie thematically, visually, and metaphorically. Yeah, I took a a film class, and I know what this shit is, metaphorically and literally has the building blocks in which to create anything. Okay, you understand? Is when you watch that movie, they can literally build any kind of world, any kind of character they want to. You go see the theory of everything, and it's fucking Stephen Hawking, and you know how what's going to happen. He's going to be in the fucking chair, and he talks like uh, R2-D2 or whatever. When I first watched the Lego Movie's trailer, I assumed it was stop motion, but no. It's CG doing a fantastic emulation of it. There's scratches and fingerprints on the toys, limbs do not bend unless there's joints to it, the frame rate purposely chugs, even effects like water and fire are made from Legos that exist. Despite the fact that everybody thinks Lego is just plastic and it's really simple, the brick technology that's behind this film is quite remarkable. Whoa! When you see a vista of thousands and thousands of buildings, those buildings are real Lego buildings that haven't been cheated, they're made out of bricks. One of the things that we're really positive about is the fact that the, the film itself is not a cheat, it's a real Lego block film. Like all of the things that you see on screen are 100% Lego blocks. The creative goal was not to make a toy commercial, but something akin to a parody or fan film. A Lego movie sounds like a terrible idea, but co-director Chris Miller saw this as a challenge. I've always liked puzzles my entire life, and this felt like an unsolvable puzzle. We were as skeptical as any smart filmgoer. We said no to directing the film. We actually said no several times, but we kept thinking, well, maybe there might be a way if you did this and this. There's only a very narrow path to go where it doesn't feel like a 90 minute commercial. Challenge accepted. And that's sort of the way we do things, unfortunately. Please, calm yourself. Green Ninja, Millhouse, Nice Vampire, Michelangelo, Michelangelo, and Cleopatra. There is yet one hope. The special has arisen. This film was written to have as many random cameos as it could without considering the licensing issues they'll later face. It's how a kid would play with their Legos. In the end, most of the characters they wanted appeared, such as Abe Lincoln, voiced by comedian Will Forte. He also played Lincoln in the director's other work, Clone High, and America, the motion picture which was co-produced by Phil Lord. Ding dong! It's America, motherfucker! <laughs> Bravo! Did you practice that line in the car on your way here? What the fuck is a car? Superman and Green Lantern are voiced by Channing Tatum and Jonah Hill, the stars of 21 Jump Street, another film from the same directors. WB was somewhat against Lantern being portrayed as a wimp, but I guess they loosened up remembering the Ryan Reynolds movie. Though some cameos were cut, ones from Indiana Jones, Harry Potter, and The Hobbit. Star Wars reps like Chewbacca, C-3PO, and R2-D2 were going to be part of the main group of heroes, but also cut. Any Star Wars material was reduced to a short segment like hell Disney's gonna let WB do any more with them. But according to your precious instructions, this ship needs a hyperdrive. We don't have that part. Maybe we could find one. What do you think? A spaceship is just gonna appear out of the blue. Are you kidding me? Early drafts even had that Indiana Jones scene in Lego form where he'd find the Kraggle, the film's doomsday weapon that needed to be stopped. And this parody, the villain, Lord Business, who was originally called Black Falcon, would sweep in to steal it. Relax, everybody. I'm here. Batman! With all the redacted cameos, Batman was upgraded from a small role to a main member of the Lego team. In the end, all those hurdles led to a hilarious use of Batman and a spin-off film I'll soon cover next. It wakes up and breaks up the scene. Another hurdle the filmmakers faced was the finale. To limit my spoilers, it's revealed these Lego toys were actually <laughs> Lego toys played by live action humans, which is like, I, I guess accurate to real life. It was the perfect way to wrap up the film, but this was nearly scrapped for being so expensive and kinda out there. Which I didn't understand at first, the whole scene takes place in a basement, how expensive could it be? Well besides getting Will Ferrell in person, there's models on display that had to match the animated counterparts. These are Lego models that probably didn't exist yet or were too hard to animate in live action. Recreated in live action. 
We almost didn't get to shoot it because there was so much nervousness about it. Even though we ourselves weren't sure it was going to work, we convinced WB to let us get the shot. We promised them if it didn't work, we had backup plans. Which, we didn't really. But I'm proud of how that put the whole movie into a different kind of context. If it catches up with you, you break your toes. Regardless of how challenging this was to build, the LEGO Movie was WB's biggest animated financial hit since Happy Feet. Though whenever I talk about it with, you know, normal people who aren't always online, they seem to brush this off as a good movie, yet still a commercial. True, I guess you can't really help it. That's likely why the Oscars ignored LEGO for Best Animated Film, but who cares what they think? Let's rank the rest of the franchise! Now when asked about the Oscar snub, the producers of the LEGO movie released this statement. That is bullshit! We'll be back with more LEGO after this. Are you tired of this happening, especially around the holidays? Well, you need... Surfshark VPN! Yes, sir! The sponsor of tonight's video! What's a VPN? It's great! It changes your internet region and protects your privacy. You got Netflix? Just switch regions and bam! You can see what other countries have on their Netflix. It's that easy. How about something to keep you safe, especially on public Wi-Fi? Nothing can stop you. Use the code REBELTAXI to get 85% off plus 3 extra months. Don't like that? You got a 30-day money-back guarantee. Oh, what, you got an incognito window on your browser? Wow, that's completely useless. Surfshark VPN, it's got clean web. This thing will block malicious ads, trackers, and malware. Don't trust an internet provider, trust Surfshark VPN. Again, use the code RubbleTaxi to get 85% off plus three extra months while you still can. You got a 30-day money-back guarantee. VPN. Hello again, uber nerd fans. I heard you blew up the Twitter sphere about my sweet new feature film, The Lego Batman Movie. You know, it's kind of like the original Lego movie, only vastly superior because it revolves entirely around me. So, rather than a sequel, WB's next move was a spin-off. Three years later was LEGO Batman. Now ask yourself, if you're gonna make yet another adaptation of The Dark Knight, what would you take influence from? Crime dramas, detective stories, classic film, noyer? Well, the director Chris McKay chose a more unique flavor to Batman. How I pitched the studio, what I wanted to do is I said that I wanted to make Jerry Maguire as directed by Michael Mann with a lot of jokes in it. You complete me. <laughs> You had me at hello. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> in some ways, that is the movie that we made. You have some Jerry Maguire uh, in the in the movie itself. Are you just a big Jerry Maguire fan? Jer yeah, Jerry Maguire about a boy, uh, Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou, uh, Scrooge, and uh, or any Bill Murray movie, but particularly Scrooge because of the Christmas Carol aspect of it. The movies listed are the common theme of ambitious people learning to appreciate family and friends. What this inspires is asking who Batman is at home. No detective work, no business, maybe a bit of mourning of his parents, but who is he outside of that? Bruce Wayne doesn't have any power, so he's often written to be overcompensated. The know-it-all that makes him useful to the Justice League. But slowing him down here is gaining custody of Robin. The duo have to save Gotham City along with Batgirl and the butler, Alfred. It's a movie about not having to do everything yourself and trusting others to do a good job. Wish I could do that. Like hell, I'm gonna hire someone to edit my videos. While other Batman movies will either ignore, downplay, or kill off Robin, here's one in favor of the Bat family. Assuming a kid only watched the modern theatrical movies and shows, would they even know the leader of the Teen Titans was a sidekick? I think back to the Simpsons gag made before Robin came into the 90s era, yet it's still sort of relevant. Adam West! Hey kids, Batman! Dad, that's not the real Batman. Of course I'm Batman. See, here's a picture of me with Robin. Who the hell's Robin? Oh, I guess you're only familiar with the 
new Batman movies. With every new reboot being grittier than the last, Lego Batman is a counterbalance of elements WB's too afraid to use in live action after the 90s. Family, goofy villains, exaggerated cities, and also blimps. Were there any blimps in the last Batman film? I don't remember. Tell us the storyline of the Lego Batman movie in 10 seconds or less. No. Polka Dot Man, Mind, Tarantula, King Cut, Orca, Killer Maw, Arch Harriet, Zodiac Master, Gentleman Ghost. Despite the voice being agonizing to do long term, Will Arnett returns as Batman with Michael Sarah as Robin. The two played uncle and nephew on Arrested Development. Will saw how talented Michael was at a young age and was very supportive of him for a while. He even emailed Michael to do Robin for this film. My name's Richard Grayson, but all the kids at the orphanage call me Dick. Well, children can be cruel. Yeah. <laughs> they also casted actress Zoe Kravitz for Catwoman. She would later play the character in The Batman five years later. Odd? I was guessing she was contracted to play Catwoman for a Batman movie long in development, maybe? But messaging LEGO Batman's director, he saw it as just a coincidence. I believe it. I remember seeing Will Arnett in a few things thinking, huh, he's got a grovelly voice. He'd be perfect for Joker. I was a bit off on the mark, but you get the idea. You know Spider-Man? Uh-huh. He's just a punk kid who got bitten by a spider. Got superpowers. You know what my superpower is? What? My mind. <laughs> Retroactively, Catwoman became an Easter egg. The film's loaded with them. They sampled every canon with obscure villains, quotes, cappy gadgets, or even... Billy D. Williams reprising his role as Harvey Dent, the lawyer who became Two-Face. He was already pretty Two-Faced in Star Wars. Now our new district attorney, Harvey Dent, will carry out that promise. This was something Lego Batman's director was disappointed by growing up on these films. Billy Dee played Harvey in the 89 Batman, but was recasted before becoming Two-Face. That's because Tommy Lee Jones took his spot in Batman Forever. Once Gotham's district attorney was horribly scarred by underworld kingpin Boss Maroney. Although Batman tried to save him, Dent's left brain damage transformed him into a violent criminal. Ah, I'm so glad Batman was just sitting in the damn courtroom fully dressed hoping to stop anything bad from happening, which he failed at. Nice going, Bats. Now, as a film from 2017, Lego Batman was one of WB's first victims of the whole look at what properties we own craze. Halfway through the plot, we're sentenced to the Phantom Zone, a dimension of banished evildoers. It's in a lot of DC stories about Superman, but this version includes various Warner Brother properties, villains from Harry Potter, Gremlins, Jaws, or The Matrix. Before this Ready Player one style was overplayed, this was a fun surprise and plays out like a kid mixing their Legos together. Plus, several of these guys aren't even owned by WB. Director Chris McKay wanted stuff outside the studio's library that could be more globally recognized. King Kong and the Wicked Witch are public domain, while the dialects from Doctor Who are owned by the BBC. Inseminate! Inseminate! The director wanted even more antagonists, but couldn't get them. Ones from Kill Bill, Sherlock Holmes, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Misery, and Gangs of New York. Oh yeah, kids love that movie. At Twins, Willy and Ponderous, Loomis and Dwab, this is a type of ethereal feast only America's greatest living director could attempt. These cameos weren't included, not because of the R rating, they got the Agent Smiths from the Matrix after all, but they just weren't as recognizable or didn't have as flashy of abilities. Strangely, Voldemort from Harry Potter is here, yet recasted. They couldn't get Ralph Fiennes to play him, despite him voicing Alfred in this very movie. Instead, they casted Eddie Izzard, a trans comedian, so I'm sure J.K. Rowling was very supportive of this. You were going to say something about recruiting the universe's greatest villains to conquer a superhero. Am I right? Uh, yeah. Well, we're in. Yay! Really? Because I brought a PowerPoint. Still print. boring! Why the recast? Well, here's what I think happened. For animated movies, the main voices are recorded early on, like years before release. The approval to get all the licensed cameos takes a lot of time. It's a lot of approvals from WB, JK Rowling, and a bunch of studio lawyers. Maybe the clearance to use those characters was so late that they didn't have time to bring in Ralph Fiennes again. That's my theory, at least. Again, I asked the director, and even he doesn't know beyond WB just not wanting the same voice. Ralph Fiennes would have been up for it, but I guess it didn't work out. Still, this to me is the best Lego film and maybe the third best Bat film. Pretty amazing for one inspired by a Tom Cruise rom-com. There's also a scene where the cast watch Jerry Maguire together. Yeah, a Bat family movie night. It sure is a bad time to forget about the sex scene. Don't ever stop fucking me! <laughs> Now, 
Now, if we're talking box office, well, it did not make as much money as the first. Whatever the reason was, I do feel like the mixture of Lego and Batman came off as even more of a glorified toy commercial. At least to regular audience members. The only flaw I had with Lego Batman is that there's no business in it being made a Lego other than, like, one scene at the end. It could have easily have been in a goofy cartoon style like Teen Titans Go or whatever. Honestly, with the involvement by Lord Miller, I'm thankful Spider-Verse wasn't done in Lego. Would have been a great film regardless, but yeah. Lego Batman's cool, but it didn't need to be Lego. Let's see how the next films handle the property. First try. We'll be back with more Lego after this. Lloyd? That's right, your son, and it's Lloyd. No, L-L-O-Y-D. I named you. You ruined my life. Pfft. That's not true. I haven't even been a part of your life. How could I ruin it? I wasn't even there. Baby, now we got bad luck. Oh yeah, Ninjago, classic film, never watched the show. Ninjago and the Masters of Spin Jitsu is a toy line hardly anyone outside LEGO fans have heard of. It's definitely not as recognizable as LEGO Batman released seven months prior. The Masters of Spin Jitsu is a LEGO brand about a ninja team saving the day, you know, like Power Rangers or Ninja Turtles. The classic Saturday morning premise of teens recruited as child soldiers. You ain't old enough to drink or vote, but possessing deadly weapons with the intent to kill or be killed is totally cool. Cool enough for... 15 seasons? 210 episodes? This aired at like 6 a.m.? How did anyone keep up with this? Regardless, even before the first LEGO movie released, a Ninjago film was already announced in 2013. LEGO likely saw how well their TV show was doing and thought movies were the next big step. As stated prior, the toy company denied any films from being made until now. So in a way, Ninjago maybe pushed the company into creating this cinematic universe. Now, with so many episodes, a Ninjago film adaptation has a lot of established storylines to worry about. Well, don't worry, the film does nothing with that. Ninjago the movie was a totally separate canon that changed the characters, casted celebrity voice actors. Oh, and these masters of spin jitsu, a martial arts where the they got the power to spin, I guess, like has a Tasmania characters, isn't in the movie. That's like a Spider-Man movie with no swinging. Oh, you're a real swinger! <laughs> Well, I can understand why all the changes. The movie wasn't made for the future Fentanyl Warriors who kept up with all 15 seasons. It was for a broad audience who never watched an episode. That alone angered the fans, but you gotta treat this in the same way you treat two unrelated Batman movies and shows. On its own, Ninjago's a hero team-up story, but the film ignores most of the crew to focus on the leader, Lloyd and his arch-villain, Garmadon, evil emperor and Lloyd's neglectful father. Yeah, another daddy issue conflict. The producers really got to talk to their kids or something. I work for, well, my dad works at IGN and... They make you work at IGN. They make you, you're a child. Oh my God, stop giving him Griff for I just, working no, at IGN. I'm trying to save his little soul. He's upwardly mobile. You know mobile. what they do at IGN? So in this film, after yet another attack on the city, Garmadon and his son have to go on a quest to work things out. Oh, and the rest of the ninja team tag along, but they're not as important. They've been reduced to mostly one-dimensional characters as we focus on the father and son. Honestly, simplifying was the best move. Despite how busy the film is, the emotional core is there. It's surprisingly strong enough to get Lloyd's voice Dave Franco emotional during recording. The first time Justin Thoreau and I got into the recording booth, we were doing this very intimate father and son scene, and I found myself crying. Crying uncontrollably. Kind of like crying harder than I do in a movie where I play a recovering heroin addict. And then we finished the scene, and I kind of took a step back and evaluated the room, and it was an interesting energy. I realized I was playing a green Lego ninja piece, and I needed to reel it in a bit. 
Pretty good, though, I don't know if it was that emotional. What I feel was missing was more development from the mother. She's barely there, yet from what was told, it seems like she should have had a larger role. With so many characters, I guess she also had to be scaled back. Had this not been based on a pre-existing property, the ninja team should not have been in this movie to begin with. Or, at least not so many members. A TV show can handle six heroes. A single condensed film? No. The opening establishes too much. They use a news report to explain the ninjas, even though if you lived in Ninjago City, that's the name of the city, you already would have known all that. Thank goodness for those ninjas. But who are these secret ninjas, Kate? We have so many questions. Burning questions. Fire Ninja. Now, unlike the other LEGO films where effects like water, fire, and grass were made of bricks, here they resemble the actual material, which I prefer. They're to scale, so small plants to us create a jungle to them. Kind of makes sense with the last two films taking place in someone's basement. Here, Ninjago's story is framed within a retelling in a kind of pointless live-action segment. A kid stumbles into an antique shop to find Jackie Chan's career on the downslope. They got him working retail? Oh man, the tuxedo wasn't that bad. As Jackie takes two hours to print the dang receipt, he talks about this legendary Lego warrior that so happens to have toys based on him. Hey, you guys gonna sell that minifig or what? Now for this action-heavy, daddy-issue-filled cartoon, Jackie Chan gets to be both a shopkeeper and the Ninjago Sensei. It's perfect casting. Jackie's an expert in martial arts and neglecting his kids. Beyond acting, he helped choreograph some of the action scenes by performing it with real people, which the animators would later reference. Even though they stick to the limitations of Lego not bending their limbs, they're able to do a lot with their motions. Pause at the right time, you'll see even the animation smears are made from Lego pieces. It's so fluid and satisfying, but I just wish there was more action scenes. As you can tell from my complaints, this movie is way too overstuffed, but overall, Ninjago is fine. It's the typical Lego movie humor and Lego daddy conflict, just not as organized. Talking finances and reception, it ranks as the lowest so far. I guess the toy commercial stigma was really hitting hard. The idea that audiences would pay to watch a film just because it was Lego was crumbling. This ain't no MCU. Hell, it's barely even a Stretch Armstrong. <laughs> Things were looking bad, and it only got worse from here. So, due to the financial downslope, several LEGO spin-offs were cancelled, the first being The Billion Brick Race, starring Diego Luna and Emma Stone. It was set for 2019 with first-time director Drew Pierce, a writer for Fast and Furious, Mission Impossible, and Iron Man 3. Though, after some delays, he later left the project and was replaced by Jorge Gutierrez, known for El Tigre and Book of Life. The Billion Brick Race was in the style of many racers, including Cannonball Run. Jorge mentioned it would have themes of race, privilege, and gentrification. You know what they say, slow and steady wins the master race. So I'm gonna guess this was a we gotta work together to save the neighborhood from getting bulldozed type of story, maybe. I don't know. According to Jorge, the final race would speed through time and other movies, including a Lego version of The Book of Life. They'd also run into Ole Kirk, the creator of Lego. This could have been amazing, though after many delays, the project was cancelled and Jorge left to produce Netflix's Maya and the Three. Hey, whoever you are! Two chicken to fight me one-on-one? No, hija de su madre! Are you... are you having the anniversary party? Without me? No! No, 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 no! Another cancellation was Lego Super Friends. It would be a Batman sequel following him trying to win over the Justice League, namely Superman, who in the past ignored him. Together, they'd face off against Lex Luthor and Omac, the One Man Army Corps. The heck is going on there? Omax basically the DC version of Captain America, but from the future and created by his same artist, Jack Koibe. He wanted to do a futuristic Captain story, but had left Marvel for DC by the time he got around to it. Anyway, Batman's director Chris McKay was back at it again 
again with inspiration from Godfather 2, Vito's Revenge. A story divided by its past and present. It would flip between the early years of the Justice Friends and present day. Another influence would be, and I'm not making this up, Boogie Nights. We'd see the rise and fall of the hero team in the same way Boogie Nights would be about the rise and fall of, uh, adult film stars in the 70s. <laughs> Interesting? The original Justice Friends cartoon premiered in the 70s, so that time period could be fun. Chris also teased a big crossover moment that could only be done in LEGO and probably never in live action. Possibly DC vs. Marvel? The film was also to be written by Dan Harmon, co-creator of Rick and Morty and Community, along with Michael Waldron, creator of the Loki TV series. With all these elements, I'm bummed these never got made, and cool factoid I forgot to mention, LEGO Batman's director Chris McKay was there since the the first of these films as an animation director. With his stop-motion experience on Moral Oral and Robot Chicken, he helped give the LEGO movies its stop-motion feel. It was the perfect way to visualize this series, but this would soon be its end. I'm the I'm the co-director, I'm the animation director, I was the head of story, uh, I was a co-editor of the movie. Jeez. And, uh, and yeah, and I also did a, a voice. Uh, in... Nice, nice, you're, you're all over the place with yeah. this. We'll be back with more LEGO after this. here at TV40 wish you a happy and safe holiday season. Hey, what's up? This is Lou Baker and you're watching the Kids WB Snow Jam. We have a new planet to blow and we are here to destroy you. Oh, man. Well, finally, after violently stepping on multiple Legos along the way, the Lego Movie 2 was released. Originally slated for three years after the first, production took five. Rob Schraub, known for writing and or directing on the Sarah Silverman show, Monster House, and Scud, the disposable assassin, was going to direct, but left due to the lack of creative freedom. The duo Lord Miller were loosely tied to the film as producers, but returned to rewrite the script after getting fired from Star Wars Solo. Now, after all the fuss and complications, Lego Movie 2 worked out pretty well. It takes place right after the first where the toys are invaded by preschool Duplos. Duplos is a brand of toys, by the way. Those belong to the little sister of the boy who is bringing these toys to life. And that's the main conflict, having two sides work together. Yeah, finally, after all the daddy issue plot lines, we get a sibling rivalry story. The girl wants to play together, but the guy's growing up and hates girly things. His toys gotta be cooler. They gotta be hardcore like Jack Stone, Nick Bluetooth, or Stretch Armstrong. <laughs> Lego Movie 2 creates the perfect follow-up, advancing the characters, yet with all the same humor. It's a message about, hey, look, Legos are fun. You too old? Whatevs. Like, if the worst thing about you is building Legos and watching cartoons, you're doing pretty good for yourself. You see how low the bar is online to be a decent person? Just enjoy your colorful bricks because damn is this movie saturated in the best ways. This ain't meant to be a toy commercial, but I sure would love to buy some transparent plastic glitter. I think the best design here is for Queen Whatever I Wanna Be, this sort of slime creature made from bricks. It's a fascinating effect to watch her move around. Another newcomer is the space pilot General Mayhem, played by Stephanie Beatrice from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. If you notice, in real life she has a scar on her eyebrow. Stephanie got that as a kid from tripping over a Lego set. A simple accident? Or destiny? Maybe it was an omen, as this is where the franchise would end. Possibly due to churning out so many films in a short time with that toy commercial stigma, a direct sequel wasn't enough to save the series. While not as great as the first, it's still a good follow-up. I just feel it's a bit convoluted with like three, four, five plots going on, and there's one scene that kind of trashes the original's message. So, you know how part one was like, hey, we're all special. Well, this one's like, uh, yeah, cool, we need someone skilled in this field, thank you. This guy was a fierce warrior. Ah! Uh. 
I don't feel it tarnishes the first, it's just a funny, hey, that situation doesn't really help in this context. To sum it up, LEGO Movie 2 is messier, but fine, it's my third favorite to an overall strong franchise that's unfairly brushed off as a commercial, which, thinking about it more, is what the first movie rallied against. Let's take extra care to follow the instructions or you'll be put to sleep. And don't forget, Taco Tuesday's coming next week! That's the day every rule-following citizen gets a free taco and my love! So, the villain of the first is a corporation that only wants structures built by following instructions, while the heroes teach the world not to listen to those rules. This is another Down With Corporations movie, yet here there's a balance between art and business, much like most of the media you consume. What I see are people inspired by each other and by you. People taking what you made and making something new out of it. The film kinda admits Legos are a corporate product, but just because it's a product doesn't mean it can't be a jumping off point. While at first the directors rejected this as a cash grab, they warmed up to the idea of thinking about clay. Clay can be used creatively by both amateurs and professionals. The same applies to Lego and to any product too. Whether you were influenced by an artsy independent film or an 80s toy cartoon, what matters is you were inspired to create something. The Lego movie has this sort of mutual respect between business and the consumer, yet at the same time, it villainizes corporations that hold restrictions. All your terms of service, rights to repair denial, overly protective music rights. It goes against a company like Nintendo shutting down fan games, unauthorized tournaments, or videos hacking their games to learn how they work. There's a lot of stories meant to be rebellious against corporations that are sold by corporations. Sure, they might have visionaries behind them, but your DVD sales are still going back into the system. The Lego Movie I interpret as a more realistic message. Basically, corporations are going to make money regardless, but the least they could do is get out the way of buyer's creativity. If you're tasked with making a toy commercial, make the best damn toy commercial you can. That's what the Lego Movie's about. Too bad some people can't appreciate that. Consider this my message and my threat to the Academy. If you don't fucking revise your list of the Lego movie, there's going to be hell to pay. Go fucking Bionicle on your ass. You don't even know what that is because your dad would fucking buy it for you. You bitch! Sorry. This is Emmett. He was so good at fitting in, no one ever saw him. A face in the crowd following the same instructions as you. But you know, he's not hes not like normal like us. No, he, he's not that special. We all have something that makes us something and Emmett is nothing. There you go. I must stay positive. Yeah, I don't think I can actually show people the real me. Doesn't he deserve a chance for someone to take him under their wing? How many times I gotta tell you, Batman works alone. Look at all of these things that people built. You might see a mess. Exactly. And a bunch of weird, dorky stuff that ruined my perfectly good stuff. You ruined my life. I don't need you. I don't need anyone. It's time to put away childish things. <laughs> Don't worry about what the others are doing. Steve, You gotta stand up for yourself. Shoot them out of a volcano. That's how I roll. You must embrace what is special about you. Oh, forget it! Break the ground. Peel up the pieces. Tear apart your walls. Build things only you can build. You're not gonna say no? Build away. Finn, did you make all of this? Didn't it turn out great? You're the reason why I get up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and pump iron until my chest is positively sick. You had me at shut up. It was love at first fight. You complete me. <laughs> what I see are people inspired by each other and by you. Uh. Whoa! People taking what you made and making something new out of it. Look at what you did when you believed you were special. You just need to believe it some more. All you ever did was support me. You are the most talented, most interesting, and most extraordinary person in the universe. And so am I. And so is everyone. <laughs> but those are the most important powers of all.
In 2020, WB announced they'll no longer be making any of these, and instead, Universal will take over. Whether it'll be a continuation or a whole new entity is unknown. Oh well, it was fun while it lasted. The Lego Movie is made for some of the most inventive animated films of modern times, yet it seemed like such a terrible idea at first. To the directors Phil Lord and Chris Miller, they saw it as yet another challenge. Considering their history of rebooting an 80s show or making a disaster movie out of a children's book, there are no good or bad ideas. It's the execution that counts. We're definitely sadistic in that way. For some reason, we don't get engaged with it until it feels impossible, or it would be really hard to pull off, but if you did it, it would be amazing. I think we're attracted to doing things no one has done before, and sometimes, in order to do that, you have to take on a totally weird project. Don't give up. Challenge again. It's a dinosaur action flick. Shadow Cop, scene three. She patrols the city and tracks down bad guys. It's the world premiere of LEGO Studios. Hook up the digital video camera to your PC and you're ready to roll. Create special effects. Edit with LEGO Studios software. Even add sound and titles. You could be the next Spielberg. Ready for my close-up. The new Lego and Steven Spielberg Movie Maker set. Digital camera and CD-ROM software included. Honey, where are my pants? <laughs>